Good morning, everybody. Um, my name's Rob, Rob Mitchell. I'm a principal social worker uh, for, I was going to say, by Alder Council, then that wouldn't have gone down well, would it? For Bradford uh, Council. I've recently moved from Coldsdale Council to Bradford. So I've been involved in the name Social Work Pilot in Calderdale um, and delighted to be involved now in, in Bradford with the Learning Disability Team. So, um, a couple of things before we start. Um, we're going to move on from the video. So, um, one of the things about this presentation is that um, it can be at times seem to be quite critical uh, of social work. Um, and I need to be kind of really clear that um, I'm a huge advocate of good, good quality social work, but I think the, the hashtag and what we're using today, better social work, is really important. Because I think social work in places is very, very good. But I think social work throughout the country could be better. Um, so there's no particular uh, issue um, with regards to blame in social work or where, where social work isn't good. But I do think it's really important that social workers in partnership with the people that they're here to serve actually grasp the nettle a little bit about improving social work and ensuring better social work. And this presentation is really about us doing that. It's about social workers recognising that they may have graduated into a profession and a system that isn't always very helpful. It can be full of bureaucracy. It can be very frustrating. But actually through working with people um, and the people that they're, they're there to serve, we can actually significantly change things and the way that we do things and the way that we deliver social work. So hopefully it's better social work. So I kind of always start with that um, analogy really about um, the fire service. And the fire service um, kind of put out fires. And everybody knows the fire service put out fires and there they are kind of all tooled up to put out a, put out a big place. What the fire service realised um, many years ago, probably kind of a couple of decades ago, is that um, whilst they got really technical and really clever at putting fires out and they reduced the amount of casualties in fires, including firefighters, um, what they realised is that they could be far more preventative in their approach. And that actually saved far more lives when the fire service began to go up and down the country. They, uh, I don't know if they tend to put your house, tend to put my house, a um, big kind of fire engine a couple of firefighters came in and fit a smoke alarm. And I think for me that's a really important um, analogy for social work. Is that the social work that I thought I wanted to be, the social worker that I thought was going to be, running off to court every week, talking about you know, the possibility of removing children, talking about mental health accessing, the tooled up social worker, the social worker that was there to save the world. Actually, that's our job, I think, as social workers. I think we are far better as social workers when we are preventative. And the only way that we can be preventative is when we're one of the community that we're there to serve. So we can come out of our ivory towers a little bit um, and start sharing a little bit more. So, um, just a bit of kind of boring text, really. And this is about, so, um, a little bit of history. Um, the, 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 the social work that I kind of graduated into, and I imagine one or two others that are here today, um, was right in the middle of um, the community care and so right in the middle of something that we call um, care management. So I was, um, I was brought into social work and I was told pretty much on day one, I had a really lovely manager, um, my first ever social work manager, but she was really clear with me on day one that my job was there to do four things. I was there to collect referrals and make sure that we got appropriate referrals for social services. Once I'd got referral, it soon became clear to me that she wanted me to assess the life out of the people that I picked up the referral from. That was the next step, got your referral, get out there and assess. So I did, churned out assessment, big 40, 50 page assessments, got lots of cases to panel, called everybody a case. I was really, really in the cycle of referral assessment. Then I kind of realised that what she wanted after that, after the assessment, is a support plan. Everybody I was told in social work needed a support plan. So I was told everybody needed an assessment, assess everything you do, and then you support plan. And you look at it. Support plans became just, I'll come on to it, became a, a box of tricks where we used to pick out services. And everybody needed a support plan. But that wasn't good enough, that was only three things. And I was thinking, well, I'm over the worst now, that's the case management done, I can get on with doing proper social work. No, 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 no. Rob, you've got to go back in six weeks' time, and then in three months' time, and then in 12 months' time. And you have to review what you've done, to review what. Do they need a, does the person need another referral? Do you need to do another 50 page assessment? Do you need to do another support plan? And in most cases, you absolutely needed to do those things. So I kind of um, was brought into social, social work. It was about that kind of cyclical approach to um, social work. Um, 
just very quickly, um, Limbury, uh, Ma Ma I think it's Mark Limbury, isn't it, wrote really well in terms of what um, case management, care management did to, to social work in the, in the 90s. And his conclusion um, was that actually, for social workers, um, the power went from social, individual social workers, didn't go to the people that were there to serve at all. The care management only actually fueled that rising managerialism. And actually the power, the power shifted to the managers and panels developed from absolutely out of nowhere. And now any kind of service that anybody might need, any kind of traditional service or direct payment that somebody might need, nine times out of ten you've got to go through the process of a panel. And actually what that is, is adhering to some managerial lines about um, authorisations for budgets. So I mentioned earlier that we kind of talk about a box of tricks. I often talk about a box of tricks for social work. And this is the social work that I really want us to reject. Um, this kind of where we go into a bag and pull out services for people. You're brought into somebody's house to deliver them out of a situation that might be in. You talk to the person, you pick the referral up, you assess the life out of them while you're in that, having that meeting with them. And then all the expectations on you as a social worker. All the likes are on you as a social worker. You are expected to fix it, what are you going to do? Nine times out of ten, I found that we go to our box of tricks. And we come out with our box of tricks and we pluck out things like daycare. Whether it's the appropriate thing or not, whether the service is modernised since it was first commissioned by the local authority 30 years ago, whether that it meets anybody's outcomes, whether that anybody's happy in the daycare unit, we might pick out daycare for something. You might be lucky, you might get a little bit of home care out of our box of tricks. If you're particularly unlucky, we might look at residential uh, and nursing care. But actually outside of that box of tricks, social workers have struggled, uh, in my opinion. So what's this like to in terms of um, performance? Well, it's defined our role, I think, as adult social workers. And I think we are reclaiming social work really, really strongly in adults now, more than we have ever done before. And I would argue perhaps more than... Children's social workers did a few years ago when they began the Reclaiming Social Work uh, project. Because I think when we are uh, rejecting the def definition of social work as being brokerage. We are not about brokerage and it's a waste of our time, but more importantly, it's a waste of time of the people that we're here to work in partnership with and to serve if we think that our role is to get the services. Because other people can do that, I would argue, other people can do that far better than social workers. For a start off, the person themselves, I think, is a far better advocate uh, and broker of services. Uh, than anybody paid by, by the state. So what did it lead to this brokerage? Well, it led to high home care, uh, sorry, high care home placement. So for all client groups, if you look at the stats up and down the country, we've carried on over the years, admitting more and more people to statutory care. The more we've talked about care in the community, the more we've talked about community care back in the 90s, the more we actually carried on in silos within individual teams and placed more and more people in care, particularly older people, adults with learning disabilities into ATUs, and the number of mental health assessments has steadily risen year, year over year. Uh, over commission of domiciliary support, so lots of home care uh, was commissioned. Uh, employment opportunities, uh, not really part of our script. As a social worker, nobody ever spoke to me when I graduated as a social worker to say, your role is to help it enhance people's lives, it's about happiness, it's about the general kind of things in society that I might attain to, like employment. Uh, which in turn uh, led to poor outcomes across all client groups, uh, particularly the learned disability services, we know premature death, um, uh, we know about health inequalities, um, we know about social workers, often working with people um, in quite advanced states of uh, health inequality but not addressing any of those issues and helping the quality at the same time. You can be working with people in the most kind of difficult housing situation. I've worked with a local authority that would work with people in um, acute difficulties around housing. But actually in terms of their care management approach, the forms, the tick box, the support forms, the assessments that they have to complete, no mention at all about housing situations that, that people were, were in. So uh, my take on this is that um, we created walls. We created walls that became blocks for people. We couldn't actually cope with the volume of people that we felt were needed through this case management approach, so we developed walls. Sometimes we developed walls that were eligibility criteria, and we like nothing better as a local authorities to turn around to people and say, you're not eligible, and we kind of wash our hands of them. Kind of hoping and praying lots of local authorities that the Care Act was going to present even more walls and even more opportunities to tell people that they weren't 
uh, needed, the one they didn't require the services of local authority. Actually, I would argue the reverse is true, and that the eligibility criteria of the Care Act is so low that the vast majority of people that pick up the phone and want to speak to local authority and say they're eligible for social care support, and I suspect that they, they, that they probably are. But so we built these walls up to kind of keep people out, and sometimes we built sometimes we built physical walls as well. So I'm just going to come on to that very briefly. So we've talked over the last kind of five years in particular about community social work. And we've talked about social work is really getting back out into the communities and being one into the communities and that our grassroots is based in community social work. This is just um, one Saturday morning, just kind of going on Google and finding out um, offices in the UK where social workers are. So how connected with the community are we? Um, these don't look like community resources to me. These don't look like the kind of buildings that um, I particularly would want to work in. Um, they absolutely don't look like, look like the kind of buildings that I would want to, to attend. They look like the kind of buildings that I might be summoned to attend if I've done something wrong. Um, you can, you, I mean, there's, there's just how many have we got? We've got four, four of those, but we've got these buildings up and down the country where we've looked at centralising social work. Kind of started 2010 11, I think. Some of the community resources that we did have we lost, and we actually started putting all our social workers together in head office type uh, buildings, whilst at the same time saying that we are community social workers. That's where we were based. So, this is um, a, a typical uh, real social services office. So, if you get through the front door of those awful, awful buildings that you've just seen, and you want to see a social worker, there's a few things that happen to you when you want to see a social worker. So the first thing in this particular office um, is that this is the reception. Um, you couldn't actually get in. So although this is a service that's open for people, the people that the local authority are there to serve, uh, you've got to have a special key to get in. The first thing is still here. Um, and who do you think has got a special key to get in? Not the people that we serve, is it? No, no it's us. So it's staff. So that's one of the first things I was given on my first day. I was given this key to the door. And that gave me access to everything and made sure that everybody else had got access to nothing. Okay, so you couldn't actually come and see it, uh, even if you wanted to. So if you do get through the front door, and the way that people actually get through the front door is they get the attention of the person behind the counter, or they hover around until a social worker's going past. And then the social worker gets out the secret key, and the person comes in there. They've got in, so they've got in, they've broken the door, they've got through. So the first thing that they see um, when they've got through the door is they see a glass panel, um, and then the top left hand side of the glass panel, zero tolerance. Yeah. You'd say, if you kick off, now that you've got in here, if you kick off, we're absolutely on your case. We'll be straight in touch with the police if you kick off. Now, you might be feeling like kicking off because actually, on your way in, you've been videoed by, I think, one of the most old fashioned video cameras I think I've ever seen. But we're so distrusting of the people that we're here to serve from a local authority perspective. We've even put the camera behind the metal grill, lest anybody get a ladder and decide to actually nick that camera. You want that be worth in the problem of to sell that, okay? Okay. If you have got through the front door, so you've had these video cameras on you, there's some seats that we've put down for people as well. They're mainly used by staff, what kind of... Um, but sometimes they can be used by people that were there to spot. We haven't spent any money on the seats for a long time, you can see they're ripped. But we're not going to pay for them, why would we pay for them in the upholstery? We can just have ripped seats. The seats, interestingly, are nailed down, and I always think that is interesting. Lest, I, I can only presume that the thinking behind that was that lest, you know, an 80 year old lady was going to lift the seat up and charge <laughs> the reception area. So hacked off was she. So these are the, for me, these are the, um, these signify culture for me. These kind of, these manifest themselves in, in the way that actually we think of you as people that we are here to serve. That we will provide you with these physical barriers. Let me move on. Okay, so I'm just going to talk very, very quickly now about um, a couple of conversations that we had with. Uh, I had with a group of staff a while ago when we wanted to kind of begin to change some of the ways that we work with uh, people. Um, and Elaine's going to keep to time when I talk about these two people because I like to talk about them for a long time. Before everybody's silly. But let me just tell you very quickly about Elsie. Uh, Elsie was a, a, an 86-year-old lady that uh, the team that I was working for and received a referral for. So these were back in the case management days, the care management days, and we received a referral from Elsie to say that she was living on her own in a part of um, Halifax. Um, 
One of the best part of the which is the biggest kind of surprise, was I walked up her door to, to meet Elsie and I realised that the front door was open. And I was the social worker that picked up the phone about Elsie, said that she wasn't experiencing the best living conditions. As I, met, as I went through the front door, um, lots of cats ran out of Elsie's house. There was some rubbish built up in the front garden. So there was clearly, from a social perspective, we're building up a picture of things that aren't particularly great for Elsie. Uh, I walked in the, the, the back room shouting out this lady's name and holding my ID card out and my colleagues uh, with me and we found Elsie sat at the back of a house in a very small room at the back of a house uh, with a, a, a ear kind of pressed up to the wall so it seemed at the time so we were kind of holding our badges feeling really uncomfortable all these cats running around all over the place and this lady that had seen us and had beckoned to us that we were kind of all right to be there but she wasn't going to talk to us because she'd got an uh, ear pressed against the wall after about two minutes, which doesn't sound a long time, but when you stood in a stranger's house and all these things that happened, it felt like forever. Um, she kind of came away from the wall and said, oh, hello, you know, what can I do for you? So we just said, oh, we've had this referral, your neighbour's been concerned about you, blah, blah, blah. Oh, and she said, oh, well, that's my next door neighbour, she's always concerned about me. And then she was kind of halfway through that sentence when she quickly went to the back of the room again, pressed her head up against the wall. And the look on her face at that time, she was kind of uh, enraptured. Whatever it was about the wall, um, we might as well have not been in the room. That was the interesting thing for, for Elsie. Uh, this happened kind of about two or three times during the conversation. And in, in the end, we kind of said to her, do you mind us asking about why you keep going across to the wall? She, was, you know, she told me what's about life and this, that, the other. She'd lived in the house for 60 years. It was a parent's house originally. Um, and she said, oh, you know, the, the, the reason I keep going to the wall, she said, it's a radio, it shouldn't be the radio there, and I'm listening to John. So we said, oh, what's, what's John, thinking he was a radio DJ or something like that? And she said, well, John is the, the man that's been talking to me over there. He's a radio announcer in London, and he's going to come and he realises the state that I'm living in. And he's going to drive up on Saturday morning. He's got a big um, car, and he's going to, I'm going to get married on Saturday morning, and we're going to drive down to London, and I'm going to go live with uh, John. Everything's all right, don't worry about things. Well, it's sorted, the cats will be sorted, John's going to actually um, save, save me from this situation. So it was quite clear to us at that point that there wasn't a radio in the room. Uh, absolutely wasn't a radio in the room. Um, or not a radio that we could hear, it's actually behind yeah, some Brussels papers. The, there was a very small, kind of old fashioned uh, transistor radio that, uh, that was in the vicinity room. So when I went up the following day to see it, really kind of confused about what I'd but by this point I'd become a mental health social worker and I was kind of back to the firefighting days, I was all kind of pumped up because I knew the mental health facts and I knew what were right for people and I was thinking, what's going on there, is this a schizoid affected, there's all these conditions that I knew nothing about because I'm not a medic and a social worker. Uh, but this one all kind of running around my head about what's going to happen with this lady. Uh, we went back up the next day um, and we had the exact same conversation. And we made a really interesting, a, a, a really difficult decision that day. Because as we kind of left Elsie listening to John again, because we couldn't speak to her, we made a decision to refer her to the community mental health team. Now, is there anybody, before I'm rude about mental health services, is anybody here from mental health services? Oh, no, no, really, okay. So mental, <laughs> mental health services is what they never ever do. We <laughs> picked up the referral for the other day, and actually got back on the phone to me and said, We've got this referral to me, you sent this referral to me about Elsie. Yeah, we've got the psychiatrist up here at house at the moment with the social worker. We're really worried about that. Why have we not referred this lady to us before? She's in a heck of a state, blah, blah, blah. What happened that afternoon is that uh, Elsie was admitted to the um, mental health villas, uh, as they were then, uh, so the, the hospital. Um, they had to bring um, police to help get her to the hospital because she refused to go. The ambulance came and went um, and said, well, we're not dragging an eight-year-old year old lady out of the house, we'll have to call the police. The police came and removed Elsie. The only kind of bit of compassion that I think Elsie saw um, from that moment onwards was one of the police officers that um, manhandled her in front of the neighbours outside uh, her house and into the back of the police van. Actually unplugged an old radio and said, there you go, love, if you want to listen to John, because she'd been screaming to her about listening to John's voice. If you want to listen to John, there, there you go. And she held the radio and was taken into um, the back of a police van. So admitted to hospital, by this point the case transferred to hospital to social workers. She's in hospital about three months, tried lots of different medications, lots of th talking therapies. She still had a reliance on the voice that she's hearing, she still talks about John and the phone, but 
to cut a long story short, she was admitted to a residential care home who couldn't actually manage her behaviours. The radio had stayed in the hospital ward that got lost and everything gets lost in hospitals. So she'd go to a care home without the radio uh, and become very distressed. The care home didn't understand when she was talking about wanting to speak to John. They thought John was a distant relative, so they were saying, John's not coming else. Well, 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 well. She was subsequently re uh, re to that hospital uh, and discharged into a specialist uh, mental health unit um, where she died within about uh, six weeks of a second admission. And I, you know, when we talk about better social work and social work that, where we have to be really self-critical and get better, I, I that's um, that was me. I was a social worker that made that decision that day to refer Elsa to the mental health team because I didn't know, other than my box of tricks, what I could do. I didn't realise about relational social work. I didn't realise who, who had got the power, who needed to make the decisions, and what the real risks were as opposed to the kind of fictitious risks that were building in the mind. Very quickly, um, so that's kind of Elsie, but it's really important to talk about social workers just to give them another outcome, which is about Andrew. So Andrew is a young man with a learning disability, living in the spot of living unit. Um, Andrew, um, whenever anybody spoke to Andrew and asked him kind of what, what he wanted to do with his life, what his ambitions were, Andrew would say he wanted to be a spaceman. That's all he would say, I want to be a spaceman. Um, Within the spot of living unit, Andrew's bedroom was decorated like um, a, a, what I think can kind of imagine me of my kind of seven, eight year old son. So it was decorated like uh, dark walls with planets on the wall and rocket ships and all this kind of thing. Because all Andrew told people, Andrew was in his mid 20s, but all Andrew told people is I want to be a space man, I want to be, that's his interest, I want to be a space man. Uh, Andrew's um, another social worker got involved with uh, Andrew at, at, at some stage. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not responsible for reality, I'm not responsible for Andrew because it's a far better end. Uh, Andrew, um, Andrew and his social worker built up a relationship over a period of time. And one of the first things that the social worker said to Andrew is, when you talk about wanting to be a spaceman, I think you're talking about wanting to be an astronaut. So Andrew was really interested in that new word, and he began to kind of play around with this new word. And he said, well, what we'll do is we'll go online and we'll have a look at what an astronaut, what, what do you need to be to be an astronaut? And the first thing that we found that you need to be to be an astronaut is you need to be able to, generally, you're either a scientist and you're going up there to do experiments in space, or you, if you want to fly the, uh, the, the spaceship, which I <coughs> did, um, then you needed to be a fighter pilot. You needed to be able to fly commercial airlines and fighter uh, airlines, and this, most of the astronauts that we have from the um, air services. That absolutely fascinated Andrew. So Andrew was off then. He was, um, they went on a journey about what you need to be to be an astronaut. The first thing was get lots of information about pilots, about becoming a, a fighter pilot by like commercial airline. Absolutely obsessed with the social worker. Let's get all this information about being um, a pilot. That moved on very quickly to um, going to visit uh, Manchester Airport to actually start looking at what, do, what does it look like. We've not been on a plane before, I haven't had a holiday or anything like that. What do airplanes look like and take off landing? What skills do you think you would be needed to do all this and when you're in the air and all this kind of thing? Andrew was absolutely fascinated by the airplane. By the, uh, the bit that really interested Andrew when they went into the terminal building at Manchester Airport was where people came and got the bags taken from, you know, when you weigh your bags and you check in and the bags shoot off and go places. That absolutely got him. He was messing around by the fact that the bag went down on the conveyor belt and before you knew it, it was gone. And the person then walked off in a completely different direction to the bag. Because that was alien to anything that Andrew had ever done in his life. The bags went one way, you went another. Couldn't kind of quite get that. So over time, and through some really good, better social work, from uh, Andrew's social worker, a relationship was built in. The, the social worker wrote to the airport and asked whether that Andrew could go and um, view. Uh, you can have a v in those days, you can have a VIP tour of the airport, which is what Andrew did. Uh, Andrew actually went behind the, um, the, the, the whole grail thing was to go behind the screens where the bags went to see where they actually went off to, what happened once they kind of went outside. And that was Andrew's interest. Andrew's interest was about baggage handling. As it turned out, it is interest about baggage handling. So she worked with a fantastic piece of work by getting the carved out opportunity to spend a few hours a week um, in paid employment uh, being a, um, a baggage handler. The interesting things for me, for me so in terms of his outcome, Andrew was, you know, far better than, than Elsa's. But the interesting thing for me with Andrew and Elsa is that their presenting circumstances to the social worker were very similar. So Elsa wasn't going to marry John, because John wasn't real. Uh, and that fantasy about John coming from London, that was 
that was as unlikely as Andrew ever becoming uh, an astronaut. Andrew probably wasn't going to go to university to get the qualifications to go on and become a fighter pilot. To, so there was both kind of improbable, or possibly, nearly impossible. The approach of the social worker was what made it happen uh, for Andrew and what crucially ended Elsie's life uh, prematurely. And in terms of the in terms of the care act, when we talk about kind of our approach, changing our approach as social workers, I can compare you to <coughs> Elsie and Andrew's way forward. Because I think in terms of the care act, the care act has got some social work values uh, enshrined in law, really. And we need to kind of embrace the best bits of the care act. Um, so if you start with, you know, else to so start with the first bit of the well-being, you want know, well-being principle, to begin the assumption that the person is best placed to judge their own well-being. And we absolutely didn't do that well, so we made those decisions. So we talk about servants, not masters. We were the masters in the situation with Elsie, and we, we decided. If you have a look, have, have a look at another one for uh, Andrew. So if you have a look at Andrew, prevent or delay the need for care and support, reduce existing uh, needs. It's like Andrew had got kind of five days a week at a day centre that he hated going to. And through better social work, actually, that was significantly reduced. We looked at a better kind of option for him, and he got some paid employment as a result of it, and in terms of his outcome and uh, seeing what we've got better. Okay, so I'm just going to finish off this, uh, this bit before we move on to the video. So it's now, uh, what, well, it's Monday, isn't it? Yeah, it's a grim Monday morning. Um, so if you think back to Friday night, the Friday that's just been, okay? Yeah, not too long ago, last Friday, okay. Eight o'clock on Friday night, it's just been. They've got to kind of remember where you were. Everybody quite clear where they were, okay. Hands up, anybody that was out, anybody on the lash, anybody drinking, out from Siobhan? <laughs> <laughs> okay, one person there. But well, I thought we'd got students in the room. Oh, students, be honest. No? There we go. Okay, so just we had one person absolutely drunk, two people. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> stealing. <scared. laughs> and they're going to steal from the bed. Well, the corner of his head, you're looking at the town centre. You can see the little town centre there, you know. Okay, anybody out for a meal? Anybody out? <coughs> yeah, okay, a bit more civilised. So not the students, this is, we've got a job at this point, anyway. <laughs> okay, anybody on the internet, anybody likely to have been? Trolling somebody on Facebook. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, on yeah, on the internet. Okay. T television. Is there anybody anybody? Yeah, that's right, yeah. 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 The only thing. <laughs> okay. So everyone will kind of doing something pretty much on a Okay. So, um, we went out um, with another local authority in the south of England and our local authority in the north of England. We went out at 8 o'clock on a Friday night and we knocked on the doors of supported living units for, uh, with people who learned to with one very, very simple question, which is, what are you doing at 8 o'clock on a Friday night? I hope you don't mind us asking, and if you do mind us asking, tell us where to go, and some people did, and we were back in the scars down as well. But actually, what were you doing? What, what are you up to on a Friday night? What's going on for you in your life? So we had these two local authorities, two separate teams, and we went out in January, March, June, and October, uh, collecting this information about what people are doing on a Friday night and supporting them at 8 o'clock. Any guesses what we found? In bed? Bed, okay. Yeah, so we got um, 63, uh, sorry, 69% of uh, people were in bed or were ready for bed. So these were adults between kind of 18 and probably about 80 was the eldest. But we had 70% of people that were in bed or involved in a bedtime routine. So they might have been in bed and asleep, or they might have been in bed and watching television, they might have been getting the supper, they might have been. But they were involved in something that you might traditionally associate with unwinding and kind of to the stage where you're kind of getting into bed and preparing for, for bed. And the important thing for me, we also have to find people in bed and eating their evening meal uh, early. So there seems to be a, a clear correlation between the early that you had your tea, the more likely you were to be in bed and sleep. So there's lots of learning that's come from this, not least out of the world self advocates. But, but in terms of better social work, I think it's a really important point. Is that when I kind of talk to people about the bedtime audit and what happened, and when I say to people, particularly social workers, when I say to social workers, what do you think we found at 8 o'clock? 
The social workers tend to say quite loudly, usually in team meetings, people were in bed. And I said, that's exactly what we found. We found that people were in bed. The difficult thing for us is that social workers know that. I knew that when I was knocking on somebody's door at 8 o'clock. I knew what I was going to find at 8 o'clock. It was merely confirming what I already knew. But I was the same social worker 24 hours before when I sat in a funding panel and I was agreeing supported living packages for people. But I knew what would be in bed at 8 o'clock. Because I tested out that hypothesis. That hypothesis because I went back out 24 hours later and knocked on people's up. So for me, there's a massive piece of learning there for social work in terms of what better social work is. If we're outraged at the fact that at 8 o'clock on a Saturday on a Friday night, people are in bed, the people that were there to say they're in bed, we need to be outraged on Monday to Thursday as well, and Saturday and Sunday as well. Because we wrote the assessment, we picked up the referral, we did the assessment, we did the support plan, we've gone back and reviewed it. And all the while, while we've been doing that, we've known that if we tip up at 8 o'clock on a Friday night, these people are going to be bad because you knew it. In the same way that I knew it. So, just to finish very, very quickly, um, our, our approach in terms of kind of defining social, better social work um, and rejecting some of the elements of case management. Clearly, kind of case management isn't going to go away. Clearly, for social work, they are always going to be involved in um, assessments and support planning. And nobody's kind of saying that that needs to be kind of done away. Really, people need that, uh, need that support. However, there's some really interesting ways that we can practice social work if we want, to, if we want it to be different and if we want social work to be <coughs> better. Um, just very, very quickly, and I'm presuming that lots of people here know, just do we recognise bottom right hand corner? Yeah. Okay, we recognise colour. Sparrow Hawk. Okay, so uh, <coughs> the laughing boy is this uh, family um, and friends called him um, who, who died um, in the in the care of the health. Okay, so left hand side here, two chaps with short hair. Short hair, I know. Anybody recognise these two men? Okay, so we've got Stephen Neary with the blue t-shirt on and his dad, Mark Neary, with the yellow uh, top on, yellow uh, top on. A huge piece of case law for us social workers to get our heads around and understand because I think that the Hilling is known as the Hilling Group. It's basically what happened is Mark, uh, Stephen Lee from this guy, Mark, Mark got falling one weekend, got in touch with his local authority and said, I need to rest by for Stephen, I need somewhere for Stephen to go this, this weekend. Um, Stephen then went into a rest by unit. The Hilling Council um, effectively refused to discharge Stephen back over to the care of his dad. Now I think that's really important for us as social workers because I think that blows some of the myths that we kind of keep quiet about. Because sometimes when we talk about things like respite care, certainly in my time working in older people's services, when we talk about respite care for people, we used to use terms like you know, a, a, a care bed that you can just go and try. Maybe you can just try, maybe you can settle in, let's see how you go into this care setting, let's see what happens to you. No, it's a myth. It's a myth. I knew what I was doing, and I knew what the social workers that I was working alongside doing, and I know what the local authorities are expecting. Me. Actually, we were calling people into going into residential care. These were the these were the people that perhaps had got dementia, family was really, really struggling with them, and we would concoct this story around them and around their assessment and have them going into a bed to try a bed. And we knew the minute that they went into that care home setting that they were unlikely to be discharged back home. And I think that's what happened in the case of Stephen Neary, I think the local authority there were very, very clear and that's what happened subsequently through the different court uh, channels that it went through. That local authority wanted that young man in care, regardless of his dad and regardless of his aunt and aunt. There's one more you might not know. This is um, Cara. She has seven She's a paid in, um, advocate. She has a uh, paid job. She's employed by Mencap and she has quite a high profile and presence on social media as well. And she was really active during the last two general elections, advocating for people's rights to their health. And she's never been in here in the same way that these two women men have. I think she just had a different conversation about, and a different set of expectations about what her life would have been. Okay, just to finish off, so earlier on I showed you some really, what I think is a really grim picture of all these tower blocks where we put social workers and then told them to be community-based social workers and they can't because they're not part of the community. 
Um, it is possible to kind of get away from the broken chairs and the cameras behind the grills. Um, this is um, the um, bottom left hand corner there is um, a shop front in the centre of a, a, a town. Not um, really long from here. That was a based on that shop our social workers um, having a, a conversation with people where assessments are the last thing on the mind of the social workers that work in that shop. What they want, in the same way that anybody who comes to a shop front, is they want to be warm and welcoming to the people that come through the door, and like that reception I showed you earlier. They want to have a conversation with the, the person. And crucially, they want to help uh, achieve better lives. And better lives they feel as a service is not likely to include traditional services. So the box of tricks has been discarded. I'll put on the back burner a little bit. So we don't really talk about daycare, home care, residential care. What we talk about are better lives and just that. What is it that you need from them? What support do you need from a social worker that might help enable um, better life? The shop is in the heart of the, it backs onto the market. Um, so it's, it's right in the heart of communities. And as opposed to the kinds of broken chairs and cameras, um, the setting is very respectful. People come through the shop door, they're offered a, a coffee from a posh coffee making uh, machine. Uh, and they're offered um, a seat on a lovely sofa. And they're offered um, a proper conversation. And one that reflects back what the culture is of the provider. The culture is dignity. It's that we're in it together. It's that we're actually your hand up sometimes if you need that hand up or not. Do you need it? Um, and we think it's really important. Um, Sam, but we've got a video to finish with. Just want to finish off with, um, so, so I can pretend I'm culture, because I'm not, I'm from the English. I'm not a culture about me whatsoever. Uh, but I just want to finish off with just um, a bit of poetry um, that we found online that we, that we really like. Hopefully it's fun. The first time I saw her, everything in my head went quiet. All the ticks, all the constantly refreshing images just disappeared. When you have obsessive compulsive disorder, you don't really get quiet moments. Even in bed, I'm thinking, they're locked door yet, the wash man's yet, the locked door yet, the wash man's yet. So when I saw her, the only thing I could think about was the hairpin curve of her lips or the eyelash on her cheek, the eyelash on her cheek, the eyelash on her cheek. I knew I had to talk to her. I asked her out six times in 30 seconds. She said yes after the third one, but none of them felt right, so I had to keep going. On our first date, I spent more time organizing my meal by color than I did eating, or fucking talking to her. But she loved it. She loved that I had to kiss her goodbye 16 times or 24 times if it was Wednesday. She loved it took me forever to walk home because there are lots of cracks on her sidewalk. When we moved in together, she said she felt safe, like no one would ever rob us because I definitely locked the door 18 times. <laughs> I'd always watch her mouth when she talked, when she talked, when she talked, when she talked, when she talked. When she said she loved me, her mouth would curl up at the edges. At night, she'd lay in bed and watch me turn all the lights off and on and 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 off. She'd close her eyes and imagine that days and nights were just passing in front of her. Some mornings, I'd start kissing her goodbye, but she'd just leave because I was making her late for work. When I stopped at a crack in the sidewalk, she just kept walking. When she said she loved me, her mouth was a straight line. She told me I was taking up too much of her time. Last week, she started sleeping at her mother's place. She told me that she shouldn't have let me get so attached to her, that this whole thing was a mistake. But how can it be a mistake that I don't have to wash my hands after I touch her? Love, it's not a mistake. It's killing me. She can find me away from this, and I just can't. I can't go out and find someone new, because I always think of her. Usually, when I obsess over things, I see germs sneaking into my skin. I see myself crushed by an endless obsession of cars and she was the first beautiful thing I ever got stuck on. I want to wake up every morning thinking about the way she holds her steering wheel, how she turns shower knobs like she's opening a safe, how she blows out candles, 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 blows out... Now, I just think about who else is kissing her. I can't breathe because he only kisses her once. He doesn't care if it's perfect. I want her back so bad. I leave the door unlocked. Mm. I leave the lights on. Mm. Okay, I can't top that, so that's the end of me. Um, <laughs> is there uh, any questions before we move on? Yeah. Okay, so you have a question? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
question. Social work movement, moving into the shop. That was echoing the stage. What you in the presentation was, was that. Um, was, that was a group of newly qualified social workers, and I, my personal experience is that I've worked with teams who have um, pushed ahead for change, um, and being sustainable has been a real problem. The biggest change that I found is local authorities that actually invest in new social workers and give new social workers missions to actually challenge some of the existing um, ways of working and I think that the example that we give there, moving into a shop front, that was the management team in that local authority were approached by half a dozen social worker, new social workers who felt, um, who felt empowered enough in terms of the privilege, in terms of the permission to sit down with managers and make a demand of managers and I think that is one of the ways that we sustain it, we actually use our newly qualified social workers better and have a bit more belief and a bit more faith in them. I've been, I've been across a lot of newly qualified social workers and I'm a practice educator yeah. and I'm quite worried that I think in terms of social work practice and newly social work, social, newly qualified social workers, the whole basis of social work for me is about building relationships yeah. and I see newly qualified social workers processing yeah. people. Yeah. You know, and I don't say, oh no, I've made, what, seven, eight years is yeah. the average length of time. But the, I've got, for me, I think the challenge back to local authorities is that the social work role on day one with the local authority needs to be like it did um, out through your training. Because what I found is what I've been trained to do, I did a degree in social work for three years, felt skilled up to do a particular job. And then on day one, I sat down with my manager and thought, why oh, no, don't you want me to do a different job? So that I've done three years on how to kind of properly kind of look at empowerment and look at anti oppressive practice. But actually, what you want me to do is this processing job. Um, I think that's the challenge, and that's what we're kind of set for these particular social workers is how do you make it feel like a continuation of what you learn at university? How do you make the social work professional role relevant to your social work professional training? Rather than keep going back and changing the training, because I think Lancaster is a great example. The social work training is fantastic in most places. Here it's exceptional. Um, the problem isn't that the social work educators. I think if you look at social work educators coming up with different fast track schemes and so the problems with local authorities, the problems with our local authorities is make sure that it's an enhanced, full, um, fulfilling, um, professional career for the social group. But it is a challenge. And I think we kind of start with discussions like this, having a really honest, I'm in the middle of having some really honest conversations at, at the moment, that are really difficult conversations with people. You don't want to be, be critical of your colleagues that you're working alongside and other social workers, social workers that have been qualified longer than I have. But I think the last week, have some kind of uh, truth to the discussion about this is, doesn't feel great and that the people that's, that we need to support are telling us that this social work doesn't feel great. I think we've got to start there.